Hey everybody, and welcome back to Parkitect. Today it's time for Hickory Hill, and the description of this scenario states that originally it's a nature preserve, and the park must thus abide by local laws preventing structures to be built above tree height. Ah, that's the catch for this scenario. That's going to make this one a little bit more difficult. Use the hilly terrain to your advantage by building close to the ground, is what they suggest. Or actually, that's what I suggest. Um, anyway, it's weird to read this as the person who actually described this in the first place. Anyway, the scenario uh, states that we must get an experiences rating of 80% and an overall park rating of 85%. So neither of these are going to be too difficult. Um, but then the whole terrain thing is definitely an extra challenge on top of that. Not to mention that I think this park is a little bit broken when you start out with it as well. But that's something which we'll see right now. Uh, it's kind of uh, a map that even though it looks nice, it's not as functional as it would like you to believe, I think. Uh, and even then, I think you can tell quite quickly if you've played a few scenarios in Park Tech that this map is not that great, uh, from a management perspective, at least. So we have quite a large park and everything is very spaced out. I guess the main attraction here is the large wooden roller coaster, uh, which is kind of the example of how you can use the terrain to actually get a big roller coaster in, even though you can't build above tree height. Uh, although I also have to say tree height is quite liberal in here. Uh, you can definitely build above the height of the trees which are here, uh, just because the trees in Park Tech are a bit scaled down and stylized. But yeah, you're quite limited in terms of how tall you can build. But aside from this wooden roller coaster, there are some things which are very spread out. There's a lot of path which is very useless. Uh, there's just a spiral slide here, and then around the other side of the park there's a carousel, and then there is a train ride which nobody seems to be riding. One guest! Okay, one guest is on the train. So that, that isn't great. And then there's a bunch of path elements which seem to be vandalized. So that's something to tackle as well. And the depot is all the way over here and employees have to walk so far to even get to the staff room or to get supplies here. Uh, I'm not sure if there is a system. Yeah, there is a system to at least bring supplies somewhere else in the park. So that's decent. Um, but the shop over there isn't even linked up. So yeah, we have a bunch of stuff to fix here, but hopefully there's also some useful stuff in the right section. I don't even remember exactly what you start off with. Okay, so we have an enterprise and the rights that the park already gives you. Not too great. Uh, this could actually be a good park for an alpine coaster. I haven't tried to build one yet. I know they're not very profitable coasters. Uh, but they are also really cheap, and I would love to try to build one, just because I haven't tried to build one yet. And a bobsled coaster, which I think works well with this terrain as well, and a spinning coaster, which usually aren't too tall anyway. Um, so that's doable. I think actually the coaster types are decent. I'm just going to have to research flat rides a bit more. Uh, and that aside... I mean, I'm not too concerned about the water rides. We can always get a log flume in, but there are already paddle boats, so that's fine, I think. Right, so having surveyed the damages, I think this park is uh, definitely salvageable and I think I'm just going to start building some rides and filling in all of this empty space to try and make it happen. So yeah, let's get started. Alright, scratch that intro. Something happened which hasn't happened in this series before and which I didn't really know how to handle, so I just ended up cutting a bunch of footage and commentary that I made because I didn't really like where the park was going. And I figured that, well, rather than putting out an episode that I wasn't a big fan of, I should just start all over again and do things a little bit better this time, both aesthetically and from a gameplay perspective. So that's generally what I'm doing. I'll throw in maybe a picture of what I created first somewhere. Um, actually, no, just right here, right now. Um, so yeah, that didn't make the cut, but I decided to do something else and eventually I liked it enough to keep going and that's what you're looking at at the moment. Sorry for that whole confusing sort of situation. What I actually want to do is build an alpine village kind of thing here, very much inspired by Austrian and German and Swiss villages and there will be a few different architectural styles here, but something that I'm starting off with is the church of the village, because that's sort of the main iconic architectural element in a lot of these kinds of places. 
Um, and specifically, these churches like to have lots of classical, baroque kind of details. So that's something that I'm trying to go for here, as well as the typical traditional onion domes and very decorative spires. So it's going to be very difficult to build a proper onion dome in this game. But as far as the baroque details and sort of overall shape of the building goes, I think you can get pretty close in Parktect. So what I decided to do is create this sort of stepped up roof um, with all kinds of, um, well, vaulted arches, I assume, inside. And then these flying buttresses on the outside, just made out of simple wooden pillars and cornice pieces. But I think it generally sells the look quite well. Um, and then on the top of the two towers in front, we have these sort of onion dome-like structures, which don't really work out that well. But given the roof pieces in vanilla Parkitect, I think they work decently. Um, so I was pretty happy with the overall look of this building. And in the end, I decided to put a carousel inside of it and remember this because eventually I kept playing and I forgot that there was a carousel inside this building. So I built another carousel right in front of it and I still haven't fixed that. Um, maybe I'm just going to keep it that way. I, I don't really have any other rides to put in here. The ride selection that you get from research is pretty limited. So yeah, it's just a bit of a funky mistake that I ended up making. Uh, before I move on, I have to admit that this building was largely inspired by the church in Sankt Johann in Tyrol, in Austria, which is very similar in terms of the color scheme and shape and basically everything. And I just wanted to use this as a reference because in Parkitect it can be very difficult to figure out what you can and cannot do. So sometimes trying to get as close as possible to a real life building sort of results in something very different. Uh, that still feels quite nice and that's uh, what I ended up doing with this building I think because even though I used the real-life church as an example in pretty much everything that I did the building in Parktech did turn out looking quite different just by nature of how different the pieces are. Now for my second building I'm building a small corner building here mostly as an experiment to see how well the wooden pieces would work for some detailed um, timber work Especially on the corner there where I have a small uh, little, I don't know what you would call it, I guess it's a small tower um, that juts out and has some bay windows and it's a little bit off grid and it's hard to get the shape of it just right. But I think with the, basi uh, the basic pieces, so the basic cylinder to create the, the shape of the tower itself and then to... Um, of the cylindrical triangle pieces, uh, cones, there you go, uh, on top of it, it creates a sort of steep spire. Spires are always a bit difficult in Parkitect to nail because there are very few pieces that you can actually use for them. Um, but usually if you just mix especially the basic shape pieces together in certain ways, you can sort of create the overall feeling of a, a steeper spire. And moving on to the third building, just a very, very simple wooden building in the style of typical alpine uh, mountain houses. I had to keep it on grid because I wanted it to connect to the corner building. Also because it serves as the entrance of the queue line for the wooden coaster right there. But next to it, I wanted to place a building which I wanted to be slightly detached. And I wanted to try and experiment and see if I could make one of these overhanging roofs that typical alpine buildings always have. So while the roof is on a full grid, the rest of the building will all be on a half grid, which is always slightly annoying because it means that you cannot use any of the cornice or uh, corner pieces. So I ended up having to use very tiny little cubes to make the horizontal wooden beams here. Um, but thankfully I can at least fill in the rest with vertical pillars. Um, so that wasn't too difficult. Um, but it does mean that I can't go too in detail with the detailing of this building because a lot of detail pieces uh, do have to conform to four grids and this sometimes makes it a bit difficult to create overhanging roofs. And I think actually overhanging roofs are one of the main struggles in Vanilla Parkitects. There are some mods where you can uh, place pieces off grid and also some mods that just give you off grid roof pieces. Um, but in Vanilla I think one of the trickiest things to get right about buildings is the, the, the overhanging roof aspect. And usually I like to stay on grid and just add overhanging roofs here and there as a bit of flavor. Um, but it can also work to 
create a roof that is fully on grid and just make the building uh, walls and other pieces themselves um, on a half grid in between full grids like that. And as a final part of this big row of facades, I ended up adding a very small little facade on the side there. None of that stuff is actually functional. Um, it's mostly just decoration. Really the only thing in that whole row is the actual entrance to the wooden coaster. So yeah. Um, but I think it is pretty noteworthy that for the corner building, I also use the sort of half grid trick. So while the most of the building itself is on a full grid, the ground floor is on a half grid, sort of creating this setback that makes for a small gallery that theoretically people could walk through, but in reality, of course, there aren't any paths. But it does look pretty cool, I think, to have this building overhang slightly above its foundation. And that's also something that typically a lot of medieval buildings do as well. Now, moving on from that, I figured it was time to add a food court to this park, and you might say there's already a tiny food court in the corner, which is totally true. There is a small food court with a, a separate zone for employees also, um, but that one I'm not a really big fan of. I really wanted to have something more central, and I wanted something to interact with the lake in a bit. Um, so this is what I ended up adding, just this large roof with a small food court underneath it um, and these overhanging sections so that people could also sit down underneath the roof and I don't just have to count on umbrellas or uh, parasols to keep people uh, sheltered. Um, so yeah, it's almost like a bit of a lakeside house or mansion or something like this or like a, a, a fisher pier house or whatever that was my general sort of intent with this it was actually a bit inspired by catfish cove by shy guy which is um one part of shy guys um i'm not exactly sure what the park is called anymore it might be wonder world but i'm not 100 sure um but anyway it was an rct3 park and a real life miniature model as well um, which a lot of custom scenery sets in the early days of rct3 were based on most famously, I think, Alpine Village, uh, which still kind of serves as inspiration for me in Parkitect for Alpine buildings to this day. Uh, but another one is uh, Catfish Cove right next to Alpine Village, which has a lot of sort of wooden buildings which play with the water and swampy uh, sort of natural environments. Um, and for me, that was uh, a small inspiration for this food court building as well. And then on the back, I'm not sure why I figured it would be a good addition to add that little house at the back, but I just kind of like the way that it looks. It doesn't actually solve uh, any logistical problems or anything. It's really just decoration there. Um, for some reason, I just didn't feel like a big tent-like roof structure completely on its own would fit very well into the layout of the park. Uh, now, next to that is the... Um, merry-go-round that I just built, uh, which was kind of unnecessary. I just totally forgot that there was a merry-go-round inside the church. Because to be fair, that's a very weird thing to do, not gonna lie. But at the time, I just thought it would be a good idea to at least turn, uh, turn the church into something useful. Um, but yeah, next to that, I'm adding another building which kind of uses a trick to have overhanging roofs. Um, so I'm using a very shallow roof to create a ground floor, which is an overhanging section, almost like a, a western kind of building. It's not something that you would typically see in Alpine architecture, but I just figured it would fit in very well here, especially considering the fact that I wanted to build a pavilion over the merry-go-round as well, as I'm doing right now. And as always, I'm trying to come up with new ways to create pavilions for flat rides. And in this one, I ended up creating this structure with different roofs on different levels and also just using different roof pieces and actually I'm really happy with it. It's one of my favorite covers that I've made for a flat ride so far. For some reason I feel the, the white and orange color combinations also work quite well with the dark wood, wooden, uh, the dark roof, uh, what am I saying? The dark wooden pillar pieces that I'm using and that also kind of come from all of the surrounding buildings. So, yeah, I'm pretty happy with that cover. And then coming back to the building next to it, I'm just adding a green roof because I didn't have a lot of green roofs yet. And as always, as for a lot of the buildings in this park, some timber work just to make it fit in a bit more and some simple dormers and other details to finish the look. And honestly, all of this is quite simple and I'm trying to avoid as much as possible sort of falling into 
certain habits of playing this game, which after a while of playing it and doing all these scenarios, I'm really kind of anxious of developing a set building style and just falling back into this time and time again. So at least when it comes to detailing and things like this, I'm trying to do something slightly different every time, but especially with some of these smaller buildings, it's really difficult to keep doing different things. Sometimes your options are just really limited and all you really need to do is plop down a wall with some simple pillars and roofs. I just kind of feel bad any time that I sort of recycle building ideas like that. Hence why, honestly, personally, I'm really happy with the cover for the merry-go-round because it's really unlike any that I've done so far, uh, as well as the church building, which is pretty unique as far as my architect buildings are concerned as well. And here, for no other reason than I just felt like it, I ended up building a big steel structure for the bridge, which is a bit um, over the top because it doesn't really need it. Technically, it's just covering a small gap in the path, so it doesn't really need to cover a large distance. There's no valley or river or anything like that. I just figured it would look nice and it would finish the, the sort of main plaza of the park on this side quite well, so ended up putting this whole big structure here. I don't know. Sometimes I, I think I probably have to feel a little bit less bad about dropping the pretense of making everything realistic and functional and just do stuff because it looks nice, because it's it's all, in, it's all in good fun anyway. Um, but here I think you can really see the, the setup of this, this park layout developing. I have the main plaza right in front of the church with their own typical uh, path textures and even some brick sidewalks. And from there on it develops into these more natural stone textures and smaller paths going into different directions and actually going to the rides themselves. So it's almost a very Disney-like approach of creating a main street. It just doesn't follow the same typical layouts of a Disney park because I have to work with the, with the terrain that we get here. Uh, or really that I made for myself here, I suppose. I <laughs> kind of underestimated one of the difficulties about this scenario and that's something that I will get to right now because it is time to build a roller coaster and a very significant challenge in this park is that you're not allowed to build above tree height. Now tree height here is pretty liberal because as you might be able to tell the trees in Park Tech are mostly tiny, um, but you're about allowed to build up to the height of a, a bubbly tree I think. So yeah, you can definitely go above the height of the trees that are already there, but you really have to stay close to the ground at all times if you want to build a coaster. So the coaster that I decided to build was a spinning coaster um, because on my initial try of this scenario I built an alpine coaster as my first ride and that thing didn't make any money whatsoever. So this time I'm gonna try to actually make this scenario successful and not fail it. So I'm going with my best bet and that is the spinning coaster which I think is just best at bringing in guests and getting me good profits. So. Here we go, a spinning coaster it is. I think it also works really well with the hillside here because all you really have to do is stick to the hillside with a small lift hill and then just do a bunch of twists and turns with some mid-course brake runs in between, gliding down that hill. And ideally, I was thinking, finally coming down to the lake and swooping over the lake in one final turn before going back into the brake run to go to the station. And this is eventually what I ended up doing and I'm pretty happy with this layout. It's one of these layouts that is just super simple, just a bunch of turns and hills, nothing much to it. But given the terrain of the scenario and the fact that you really have to stay close to it to not overshoot the maximum height that you're allowed to build, I think it works out pretty well. And um, I try to also make it look good from two main perspectives. So I'm trying to make this look decent from uh, this sort of perspective coming from the lake. Uh, but at the same time, if you're looking down from the hills, if you're looking from the perspective of the park entrance, I think it works decently as well. Um, I don't know, for me, sometimes, or actually no, I'm always looking for a balance between how a coaster looks and how it would realistically ride. And for this one, I think it does okay on both fronts, although it isn't quite as realistic in terms of layout, uh, regard well, compared to how it looks. But at the same time, spinning coasters aren't usually terrain-conforming coasters. So 
It's, it's definitely a bit of an odd one if you'd compare it to real life spinning coasters which tend to be much more compact and do a certain uh, set amount of elements and this one doesn't really do that. Now for the station, I'm keeping it very simple here. The station's interesting because I split it into a loading and unloading section as spinning coasters will often do in real life or at least I think they should because not doing that kind of makes the whole thing a little bit less uh, efficient and in game it always works out as well because it means that people don't have to spend as much time in the station loading. Although for this coaster it doesn't really matter because it does run on block breaks and people have to wait for the next car to clear the lift hill and guests don't take that long to get into the cars so usually it's fine in the game anyway but yeah I guess for realism purposes and just because I like it I wanted to have an unloading and loading station as well. And then over the loading station we have the taller section of the building and the unloading station with the exit is a, is a smaller part jutting out from that and at the back we have a small cover going over the queue line so that people aren't, you know, exposed to the elements while they're waiting in line. Now there are a couple of quirks to this coaster that I'll have to discuss as we move to the real time section in a bit. Um, but for one, I had to change the, the lift hill speed to make sure that they don't get stuck on some of the block brakes because I want this thing to continue running uh, and I don't want people to suddenly be stopped at one of the block brakes to let the next block be uh, cleared. Um, but the bigger problem was that the final block was way too long so I ended up having to replace the final block break with a, uh, um, a regular break because it didn't actually make it from the final block break onward. The car couldn't even reach the station so I had to remove that and have one less train on the circuit, which is a bit of a shame, but oh well. It doesn't really matter too much because it doesn't actually cost me that much money in the long run. If that was a bit too difficult to understand, let's go to a quick real-time section and see how the park is doing. Alright, so that was a bit of a roller coaster. You guys didn't see it, but I tried to make this park work right after the time lapse and really tried my best to manage prices and employees and all that stuff and it just didn't work. I just kept, well, making losses time after time until I was bankrupt. So that was terrible, um, but I realized that one shortcoming was probably the sole cause of this and that was that I didn't have a high intensity ride and people were very upset about this and started demolishing everything and not really wanting to pay for anything. So on my retry, I decided to just build this enterprise, put a tiny little no effort queue next to it. And that's pretty much all I did differently. And it made all the difference because now I'm making uh, a profit, uh, decent as it is. Uh, it's not always great as you can see, but generally I'm making a pretty decent profit. I've been doing research and fixing the park up and I've even been able to get very close to the goals of this scenario. It's slightly less good at the moment, but I actually made it for a few times and I think it's not as good at the moment for perhaps vandalism reasons, which keeps being a challenge. Um, but the goals are in sight and I've almost made it. I just need to make sure that I can hold them for two months. So. Yeah, interestingly, it didn't go that well for a long time, but as soon as it started going well, it just kind of went well really quickly. And um, I've barely played this scenario for a few months, and I'm already doing this well in year two. So really happy about that. And I guess my next plan of attack is just to build something over here to fill up this empty space in what is going to be the sort of main street area of the park and also put some scenery around the Enterprise, finish up some of the paths on this side and on this side, which don't really have the, the textures and detail of the rest of the park yet, and um, hire a bunch more mechanics and uh, security people, because people are still destroying everything and vandalism is still a big issue. But that aside, I'm making money, the rides are running well, and people are happy about the park, so let's just keep going and see where it ends up. Alright, now if my voice sounds a little bit shabby for this part, that's because I got a cold again. Don't know what it is, this is like the fifth time in two months that I got sick somehow, so... Uh, maybe I've complained about this before, but uh, I need to get my stuff together. Anyway, that's, that's part of the reason why it took me so long to get this video out, but by now I want to get this out as quickly as possible, so I'm just recording this right now while I feel that I have the possibility to. Anyway, that is wildly off topic again. 
Uh, for this part, I'm gonna try and finish the sort of main street, main plaza area. And I figured it would work well to add another building with large overhanging roofs because it really, you know, makes the tone of the Alpine village quite a bit more believable. I just have to make sure that every time I do this, I have an appropriate space where I can make one of these buildings that is completely off grid. And this square over here feels like just the right place. So again, this building is very much inspired by buildings that you'd find in Tyrol or Switzerland or North Italy, these kinds of areas. Very large, big overhanging roofs, kind of a, almost like a farm building. Um, really the kind of building that you'd find only in really small towns because big cities do have more standard sort of Baroque city blocks. Um, but these old traditional Alpine houses I think are really cool. Um, and they're actually quite large as well. If you look at, in general, the size of buildings on this, uh, well, scenario, I guess, they're actually pretty large compared to what I usually do, just because I want to fit them in on 4x4 four four spaces, typically. And, you know, use some smaller buildings to fit in the spaces between that. Um, so speaking of that, uh, I did want to connect a building to the church, which is a bit strange, I suppose. Normally you wouldn't really see that too much. Um, but for finishing off this street and blocking the view of <laughs> this sort of shabby looking area behind the church, I decided to add this small house here anyway. I don't think I'm going to give it a purpose, it's really just here for decorative reasons and to finish the main plaza in a nice way. Um, but then again, usually <laughs> I do build buildings beforehand and then try to come up with a possible use for them later on. Uh, and at this point, I already have the bathroom buildings, I already have some food and drink stalls, and I've got a bunch of flat rides in some of these buildings, so I don't really need anything else. It's really just scenery at this point. And with a little bit of foliage, especially planters, I think you do get a decent feel for the alpine style. I really love the fact that they always have a lot of window boxes with flowers in them. It's really easy to make buildings look nice with some foliage, so I always appreciate if you can thematically add a bunch of foliage to it. Uh, I know this is something I always bring up, but just the fact that architects, when they're making renders, always put down way too many trees and shrubs around their buildings, and especially on the balconies, just says a lot about how much foliage uh, sort of helps in creating a, a very charming and attractive urban uh, setting. So. That's definitely something that I always want to focus on quite a bit as well. And I really wasn't sure what to do with the enterprise section over here because I never really intended for this enterprise to be here. It's really just for gameplay reasons that I need this thing to even make a profit in the park. Um, so I'm just gonna generically theme the area around here with a bunch of trees and some path details and a small cover for the queue, but that's just about it. I just know that it always irks me to see this empty area in the ring underneath the Enterprise, and I know I really don't have to do anything with it, um, but I decided to add some support structures to it and a little bit of decoration, as though it were some kind of fairground ride that needs uh, to be set up like that, even though, realistically, I know in this game it doesn't really need to. But yeah, the, the, the Enterprise on its own just feels a bit empty, and I'm not a big fan of that large empty circle in the middle of it that you get typically. Um, so I did change the queue a little bit, made it go zigzag a bit because that first queue was purely just to get people in there. Um, so this is also a nicer shape to add a small roof to and make sure that people are sheltered from whatever elements are gonna attack them in this scenario. I don't think the weather is actually too bad, but it always helps to add something like this. To be honest, I think there are flat rides which are easier to theme, and flat rides which are definitely a lot harder to theme, and the Enterprise is just one of those things where I never really know exactly what to do with it. Uh, because it moves around a lot, you can't really put anything above it or around it, so you're very limited in terms of what you can actually do with it, so my theming for these things tends to be very generic and very basic, um, but yeah, I guess that's something that can't really be helped. Now this part is a bit more interesting, um, I decided to add a train station to the train stations, uh, like a proper train station building, to the train stations of the train that's already in the scenario. I didn't really know exactly what to do, I didn't have a specific plan for this, I just started doodling a building and uh, just hoping it would turn into something decent. 
Um, but it's it's a very generic sort of train station uh, type building with one main section parallel to the rails and some additions here and there. And of course, in the end, a small spire because that's something that I can never really help but adding. Although something that I kind of wish I did a little bit more is that I did do a roof where it gets a bit steeper in the middle, which is a nice way to deviate from a standard flat simple roof. And I think especially in this case it adds some much needed height to the profile of the building. Um, and just overall with that one um, sort of gable facade uh, sticking out on the front, it does make it look a bit more inviting from the, the, the sort of path perspective. And I did decide to keep the foliage in front of this very open so that, well, theoretically, if you're looking from the path, you can see this station in the distance, a little bit up the hill with some very close to the ground, low shrubbery kind of foliage in front of it. So I'm imagining that this would be a pretty cool uh, scene to see from a path perspective. And for the spire, I'm doing something very simple, I guess. Don't want to experiment too much with that. But I did eventually change the color because looking at this, I do realize that it's a lot of brown. And even though that's sort of the thing that comes with the territory of making an alpine themed park, I definitely want to have a bit more color in there as well. Oh, and to finish the village a little bit, I decided to add another slightly off-grid building over here, except this one is a bit smaller, only two floors with one uh, whole floor and then an upper floor just kind of underneath uh, this very shallow roof. And it doesn't really serve any purpose, it's just there to uh, finish off the village a little bit. It's always tough to transition from an area with very dense architecture and just a dense urban fabric in general to a more outdoor forested area. So this is kind of going to be one of those transition buildings that doesn't really serve a purpose and it's kind of a little bit smaller than the actual useful buildings just to kind of blend everything together a little bit better. I do have to say, as far as architecture goes, this is actually probably some of my favorite uh, main street sections in scenario so far. It just works out better in the theme than I expected. And of course it is a redo, so everything that I did wrong on my first try I tried to uh, take into account here. Um, but I think in the end it actually worked out pretty well, and especially with the church with the square in front of it like that. Uh, I'm pretty happy with the result. Only thing not to pay too much attention to, I guess, is the fact that the fountain is not perfectly uh, straight in front of the church because that fountain section is 3x3, three three, whereas the church is four tiles wide. So everything is a little bit asymmetrical, but personally, that's just something I like doing. Um, but I guess that really comes down to personal preference as well. I know a lot of people like to make everything symmetrical, but for me, it's already a big deal that the church itself is symmetrical. I was really considering at some point making two different spires on both sides, but then I just thought that's something that these Alpine Baroque churches don't really tend to do, so... I'll at least give them that. And over here, I'm just trying to add a bit of scenery to the parts of the park, which I'm not really adding anything to, but that at least I want to change a bit so that they fit a bit better with the parts that I've been doing. And I think people who pay a lot of attention to my path work have probably already noticed that I'm straying away from what I did in most of the episodes so far. I used to really um, have these threads of path that kind of intersect, so you get different colors uh, that sort of wind through each other, whereas the approach that I'm taking for this one is to just get three different shades of each path type and plot them down kind of randomly everywhere uh, to get a bit more texture overall, but so you don't really get these different threads of different colors that run through each other. Um, and I'm not sure which approach I like more, I do think this one's a bit more realistic, um, but it might not be as interesting to look at, and it's also much more subtle, it's something that you don't notice quite as quickly, I think. Anyway, moving on to one of the last parts of this video, and this is the other train station. For this one, I once again just decided to doodle a bit and see where it ends up. I do think I like this one a bit more because it's more out there and more unique and a bit more daring. I was less afraid to make mistakes and just kind of did whatever I feel like. And even though the general setup is the same with a spire on one side, 
uh, along parallel to the rails kind of roof and then um, one facade pointing toward the entrance to kind of make this building look a bit more inviting. It is a lot, it, it is very much different actually in terms of colors and pieces and just a bit more experimental. Uh, one of the things that I actually really, you know, like more and more the more that I play the game is just those basic shapes and the fact that you can just um, resize them to whatever you want. So it's really great for making smaller spires or, as is the case with this building, creating a, a, a top floor of the spire tower which is slightly more narrow than everything underneath it. Um, so that creates a very neat spire. Uh, just altogether, the green roof of the, of the tower plus the red roof of the middle section and the brown roof of the entrance just makes for a, a nice color combination that I think always works out. Anyway, that's it for this episode, so let's get back to the game and see how the park is doing. Alright, we're almost there. Looks like I'm gonna make it this time. And... Oh, this is always a bit awkward anyway, isn't it? There we go. And that is the scenario. So. That actually wasn't as difficult the second time around as I expected it to be, but the first time was a major struggle. I guess it kind of shows that sometimes you have this butterfly effect of just doing one or two things wrong and it just ends up crashing your entire scenario. So if there's any kind of gameplay tip that I could give based on my experience, it's to always keep multiple saves of your progress. At least that's the thing that saved me in this case, so I didn't have to restart the whole thing. Um, but at least I could start from a better perspective and get it done this time around. Alright, now you're probably dying to let me do a bit of a trip of the park, so I actually want to start off with the woody, because that's something that I still haven't shown off. But something that's really interesting is that this thing has been making better and be uh, better profit as the years go on. Uh, just because it wasn't really functioning up to full capacity in the beginning because I didn't have enough people in the park, um, but there was this kind of cumulative effect of getting more people into the park and thus this ride making more money and thus the whole scenario becoming a bit more easy as time went on as well. Especially if you're struggling, I think, um, just putting your money into loans and building a bunch of rides can really help in this aspect because it makes uh, sure that all of your rides are functioning at their utmost capabilities, I suppose. Um, so yeah, as always, I need to keep everything very close to the ground, and when the scenario was being made, at least I had the advantage that I could do some terraforming. So you do see some uh, basic terraforming around the layout of this coaster, especially in here where you have this valley uh, that you go through. So that's something that you can't do when you're playing the scenario, but it kind of does show off how you can use the terrain to your advantage and keep your coasters low to the ground while at the same time giving them an interesting layout. Um, so, yeah, this was definitely a ride that I thought would be interesting to fit into this scenario. It's also very much inspired by the coaster in Rainbow Valley in Roller Coaster Tycoon 2, and I think people who played that game probably recognize the layout in that a little bit. Uh, very close to the ground, lots of curves, uh, a little bit C uh, GCI also, and there's a touch of Boulder Dash in it for me, especially with the way that it interacts with the lake over here. Uh, I thought Boulder Dash is just this really, really cool wooden coaster and probably one of the best ones out there. Would really love to ride it one day. Um, but yeah, that was also a big inspiration on this one. Now let's cut to the spinning coaster, which is actually the only coaster I built in this entire episode. Kind of rare to only build one layout, but I think a spinning coaster is the best thing that I could go for here, given that the Alpine coaster is very hard to make profitable and the bobsled coaster is also not too easy to work with. Uh, this is a decent low budget yet terrain conforming spinning coaster and I think it does more or less what spinning coasters do well. The only problem is that the last section of the layout doesn't have the block brakes anymore because uh, well it has to go through this uh, brake section here with a decent speed in order to even finish the final half of the layout. So that's a bit unfortunate. It's definitely not the most um, efficient spinning coaster out there but I do like the way that the layout interacts with the paths and uh, the way that it just works with the scenery in general. So that is the spinning coaster. I actually think it might look a bit better from this perspective. It really clearly shows off all of the curves and the way that it hugs the terrain as it goes down the hill. Um, 
but yeah, this is honestly one of the first scenarios where I really tried to make everything look decent from all of the four basic isometric perspectives. Too often I just focus on one perspective, but given that the scenario is surrounded by hills on all sides, I wanted to try and put some more effort into making it look good from different angles as well. So that's definitely something that kind of worked well in the end, I think. And yeah, then we have here just the main street area with the, <laughs> the church, which just completely dominates the park and which I think is quite a weenie. It's a bit strange, I suppose, to have uh, a religious building like that as a main weenie. That's not something you really see in theme parks, which I suppose tend to be a bit more just commercial. But given the theme of this park, I really, really just wanted to do it like this. It's a bit Jaegerhorn-ish, I suppose, as well. And yeah, that is basically it for this scenario. So. I guess I'm gonna call it a day here. I'll just save and head over to the main menu. I can't over, oh, it's an autosave, of course. So this was actually my third attempt. Attempt one was uh, just the original file that I didn't really do anything wrong on, but attempt two was the one where I messed up everything. So I think saves in that sense kind of helped me out here. But I'm actually really curious which park or which scenario I'm gonna get out of this because I don't really remember, so. Let me just see for a second. Ah, we finished Hickory Hill and we got the spire of the main building as a decoration. I actually didn't know that, but that's pretty cool. And from there, I'm not sure if we're gonna get a new one. No, okay, so that's it. I'm gonna have to either play Kaiserberg or um, Sakura Gardens at this point. And I'll have to be honest, I've been working on Kaiserberg for a while, but I've been working on it on my laptop, and I'm not sure when I'm gonna be able to finish that one, uh, but I'll see. But it's something that I've been working on at the same time as Hickory Hill, so hopefully I'll be able to get that out a bit more quickly than Hickory Hill, which took a few months, um, strangely enough. So yeah, I'm gonna try to be a bit better, but I can't make any promises because I'm kind of busy with some other stuff as well. Anyway, I hope to see you guys in the next episode, which I can already tell is going to be really interesting and actually a little bit similar to this episode. And I'd like to thank you for watching this video and see you next time.